There are millions of people who are living this pilgrimage next to us. And so we greet them and we give thanks to them for their fidelity, their constancy, and for wanting to get to know the land of Jesus and Our Lady and accompanying us in this walking of the Holy Land. Here you saw where the where the rock was, Jesus was sitting there. And when we, we have Mass, you'll see where Jesus enters, from where the Lord comes. He comes from receiving a bad news, and He comes very sad. He came from listening, from hearing that they had murdered His cousin John the Baptist. And the scriptures say that Jesus, when He had heard what had happened, which is the murder of St. John the Baptist, he went away from where he was and he got onto a boat to go to a place of peace to be by himself. In these days we're going to, to go to the place where Jesus usually went, which is very close to here actually, where Jesus would go to be alone in prayer with his father. But the Lord crosses the lake and comes here to try to reach there, the place of prayer, so He can be alone with His Father. Because He comes from hearing that His cousin, the one who was the voice who cried out in the desert, who would prepare the way for the Lord, was assassinated. This must have been a very painful moment for our Lord. But the people, at the end of the day, with Facebook or without Facebook, the people realized that the Lord was coming here. And the Lord, and people started to come from all of the different towns, and sometimes it is difficult to imagine that for us, that the Lord would go somewhere and that people would come from all the different towns, from Samaria, from Judea. Even many times people came from Jerusalem of all of the close towns would come to hear the Lord. And that is why the Lord always sought moments to be alone. Because even though He knew that His mission forced Him to be amongst the multitudes, His heart was always seeking to be alone with the Father. And that is something that is very important for us. Because... Sometimes we are called to have many responsibilities, some that are more public and some that are less public. But at the end of the day, we are all filled with responsibilities. And it is always necessary to seek a place chosen by the Lord where we can go to be recollected in silence, alone with the Lord, as we were this morning next to the lake, next to the Sea of Galilee. When Jesus arrived, he thought that he was arriving to a place where nobody was going to be there with him, where he was going to be alone. But when he arrived, he saw multitudes, a great multitude came. And here I want you to pay attention. That is why I give the introduction. What did Jesus have in his heart? What pain did Jesus have in his heart? What did he need in his heart? He needed silence, prayer, to be alone with the Lord, to speak with the Lord. That is what He desired. But He comes here and His desire is totally, is what was His desire is totally opposed to the reality. There is a great multitude coming from many different towns. And Jesus, instead of becoming angry, when He needed to be alone with His Father, when He needed the consolation of the Father, what does He does? Seeing this multitude of people, sitting all around him, some who even were climbing on trees to hear him. When he sees this multitude in that same place, he, because for Jesus, the other is always first. And what does the Lord feel for the great multitudes? Compassion. Compassion, in reality, is the closest translation that we have but it is more than more than compassion what the lord felt is what the lord felt is what a mother feels in hebrew well father joe can explain it better but in hebrew 
the word speaks of the of a mother. It speaks of the feelings of a mother. It is a motherly sentiment, a care for all of these people that were here. And so it is more than just compassion, because some of us may feel comp compassion for a person that something happened to them. But no, Jesus, when he saw these multitudes who were waiting for him, who knows for how long, the Lord felt a desire to do something to help them. What is the first thing that he does? And we think that the first thing that the Lord does may be to multiply the bread and the fish. No, the first thing that he does is that when he saw the multitudes and began to walk amongst them, he began to heal the sick. How beautiful, right? In his compassion, the first thing that he did was heal the sick. And then they, the disciples got close to him. And, and this is something that is very important and speaks to us very much. The disciples came to Jesus and they told him, Lord, this place is deserted. And it's already late. Imagine the logic of the disciples. It is not a correct logic. It's late. It's a deserted place. Let these people go so that they may go to the towns, as if the towns were very close to them, so that they may go to the town and that they may buy food for themselves. Look at the logic of man. The Lord is moved by compassion for these people, for this multitude that has come from all of these different towns and who have been maybe days waiting for the Lord. And the disciples do not feel compassion. They do not feel compassion. That is something very important that we may reflect on this, what is happening in the hearts of these of Jesus. What are the sentiments going through his heart? Jesus, who came with an immense pain, forgets about himself and has this feeling towards the multitude of compassion. And the first thing that he does is heal the sick. And the disciples, what do they feel? They do not feel compassion. For them, it didn't matter to them, the people. And that must speak to us very much of ourselves. What do they tell the Lord? Lord, as if the Lord didn't know. Lord, it is already late. This is a deserted place. There's nothing here. Tell the people to go. Can you imagine the Lord telling people, go, leave, go, and go figure out how you're going to get food? That's what the disciples were thinking, and that's what they expected that Jesus would do. And why did they expect that Jesus would do that? Because that is what they wanted to do. But they did not have the courage to do it, and so they asked Jesus to do it. And so here are the great teachings of Jesus. But Jesus told them, tell them to go. And Jesus tells them, you yourselves Give them to eat. With the Lord, you do not play games. You cannot turn it around on Him. The Lord saw the lack of compassion of His apostles that said, tell them to go away that they may find food. 5,000 men? And we don't even know how many women. If there were 5,000 men, well then imagine plus the women, plus the children, where were they going to find food? Where were they going to go? To what town were they going to come to find food for all of them? And the Lord is responding this to the apostles because He wants to, to pierce their hearts and show them their lack of compassion. No, there's no need that they go. You yourselves are going to give them food to eat. What a response of the Lord. Here the Lord gave a direct correction to the apostles. And so the apostles very intelligently told him, Lord, we do not have here more than five breads and two fishes. And the Lord tells them, bring them to me. What, is the, what do the apostles respond? How is he telling us to feed these people if we only have five breads and two fishes. 
the logic of man at work. And Peter tells, sorry, and Je- Jesus tells them, "Bring it to me," because when the apostles were saying to them, "Him, when they have five breads and two fishes," what were they telling him? We don't have enough even for us, the twelve apostles, plus you, thirteen people. And we're going to give food to all these people. There you, we see the selfishness of man. The little bit that we have, we're going to keep it for us, because even for us, it's not enough. But Jesus tells them, "Bring it to me." He takes it from them. What a pedagogy of the Lord! Remember that the Lord is always not only reading the events of history, but also reading the hearts of man. And He is reading that the heart of the apostles in this event do not show compassion, do not worry about their brothers, but instead are thinking of themselves. And the Lord has to has to take away this. Vice and this capital sin from them, and so the Lord tells them, "Oh, well, is that the only thing that you have? Great, give it to me." Can you imagine how they must have given it to Jesus? <laughs> Almost like I don't want to give it to you. And Jesus, after asking. All the people to sit down on the grass. How beautiful this detail of the Lord, the Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, unto whom all knees should bend. Asks the people to sit down, and why, brothers and sisters? Because the Lord worries for us about our needs, and not only our spiritual needs, but also our material needs, our physical needs, and the Lord. Sees that these people must be tired, not only hungry and thirsty, but also tired, and so that is why he tells them, "Sit down on the grass, not on the rocks. Sit down on the grass. The good pasture leads us to green pastures. Sit on the green pastures." And he himself takes the five. Loaves. The face of the apostles must have been marvelous. He takes the five breads and the two fishes, and the people are all sitting. The apostles are around him, seeing what he is going to do with those f- five loaves of bread and those two fishes. He takes them in his hands. He lifts his eyes to heaven. How beautiful, brothers and sisters! In each miracle of the Lord, we're going to read that He lifted His eyes to heaven. Why? Because He was praying to the Father, and this has a very immense significance. Because Jesus is God, made man. But He, from the beginning, He says it: "Father, I have come to do Your will." He says, "My food is to do the will of the Father." And what does he say? He says, "I do not say anything, and for me, it is amazing that he says, 'I do not say one word, Him being the Word made flesh. I do not say one word that I have not heard from the Father.' And the Father and I are one." That is to say, everything that Jesus is going to do, he does in communion with the Father, and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because in Nazareth, he said, from the book of Isaiah, "I am the Anointed One. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To what? To do all that he did here." Well, he lifts his eyes to heaven in prayer to the Father to teach us, brothers and sisters. That in every moment, the life of a Christian at all moments begins and ends with lifting our eyes to heaven, with prayer. Everything should be prayer. Without prayer, there is no nourishment. Without prayer, our souls are not nourished. Without prayer, our thirst is not satisfied. Without prayer, sim- we are simply dried out interiorly. 
the Lord is teaching us that before a miracle, Him who can do a miracle at any moment, He asks the Father so that He may do it in His name. In His name, because Jesus does everything in the name of the Father. Now, a very beautiful thing happens. He lifts His eyes to heaven. He asks His Father to teach us that what He is going to do is in communion with the Father. And what is the next thing that He does? What each one of us should do before we eat in each home. He blesses. He pronounces a blessing. How interesting that He is the one to pronounce the blessing. What is He saying with this? That there is going to be food because you don't bless an empty plate. He pronounces the blessing and with this here in the gospel, Jesus is teaching us that we cannot in any place, any restaurant or not restaurant, at home or not at home, in a place we cannot eat without blessing the Lord and giving thanks for that food. And let us not be embarrassed because let me tell you something. Do the sign of the cross at restaurants and you will see other people starting to do it. Nobody wants to be the first ones, but let us be the first ones so the second and the third ones may come. And so after he pronounces the blessing, this already begins to have a Eucharistic cognitation because you will see the similarities when we go to the cynical. He broke the bread. How many breads were there? Five. No matter how much he might have he might have broken it, it might have been 20 pieces, but he breaks the bread and he gives it to the disciples. And these began to pass them out to the multitudes. And so what is the Lord doing? Oh, you that wanted to send them away? You that wanted them to leave and to, so that it may not be a bother for you? Now you are going to be the one that is going to serve them. You are the one that is going to give them food. You are the one that are going to Give them food with the miracle that I have done, but with what you have given me. And brothers and sisters, this is something very important. God and Jesus here, he did a miracle. But all miracles are surrounded by an act of charity. He always invites someone to make an act of charity, just like he did so with the with in the house of Peter, if these four friends had not come with the paralytic and put him on the roof and lowered him from the roof, then Jesus would not have been able neither to forgive his sins nor to raise him up. The charity of someone is always required for a miracle. And that is something very sad that we both see. In Jerusalem, in the pool of the blind man that was blind for 30 years, waiting for someone to put him into the pool. He was waiting. The Lord always calls for the charity of someone so that he may do a miracle because love can do all things and moves and is moved by anything to do love. And so the disciples are going and they're passing out, passing out, passing out food. And the scriptures say that all of them, all of them ate. And look at what it says. They ate until they were full, until they were totally full. And even then, there were remains, there were extras. How many baskets were the leftovers? Twelve. A very important number, right? Twelve apostles, twelve tribes of Israel, twelve stars of Our Lady, the number 12. And there are 12 baskets left over. There were only two breads and five loaves, sorry, two fishes and five loaves. And now there is food for 10,000, 12,000 people who ate until they were full. Here the Lord is already speaking of what He is going to do in the Senegal. He's going to institute priests who are going to give the bread of life. And there's a multiple. And in the Eucharist, there is a multiplication of bread because where the priest is and the Eucharist is celebrated, the word of life is given. And so in the whole world, the bread of life is given out, which is the Lord, by the mediation of the priest, just like here, it was given out by the, medi- by the mediation of the apostles. 
There were 12 baskets that were left over, and imagine the baskets, they weren't like the ones that of our time where you put the, the offerings. No, there were big baskets, and there were 12 left over. And the ones who ate, the scriptures say, were 5,000 men without counting the women and the children. But after, Jesus asked the apostles to go to the boat and to go ahead to the other shore, to the other side of the sea, so that he could remain alone, just visit the people, see that the people would go. But now the people have gone nourished by his word, rested, and also physically nourished. An important thing, and Matthew does not mention it, but Mark does, is, brothers and sisters, that Jesus what did Jesus do with the leftover baskets? They took it, right? He told them to put it with them into the boat and to take it so that nothing would be wasted. And here there is another very important teaching of our Lord for us. Brothers and sisters, serve yourselves what you are going to eat. You cannot waste anything. The Lord here tells us austerity for charity. Because the whole point of our entire lives, the entire goal of our lives is love. We must do everything for love and everything must have as a goal love. And so brothers and sisters, why were there 12 baskets full? for another multitude that they might find somewhere else. And he tells them specifically that nothing should be wasted so that others could eat. And this is a teaching moment for all of us that live in a relatively comfortable way. Brothers and sisters, I cannot tell you what to do because that is between you and God. But ask yourselves, do I need three blue shoes? I'm using that example because when I was young, I really liked shoes. But do we truly need three pairs of blue shoes? Do we truly need ten yellow sweaters? But we live in a culture that is very con a consumerism. And if you see TV, if it's not food that makes you hungry immediately, they put all the things that you need to buy, everything that they tell you that you should buy, because if not, you're not pretty, because if not, you're not in fashion, because if not, all these lists. But we must ask ourselves, Lord, I have 12 extra baskets in my room, 25 extra baskets. And perhaps there are brothers and sisters who have nothing. And so, it's Lent, and we're talking about almsgiving. Almsgiving is not just throwing a couple of pennies into the basket. The only, the only church that has pennies in the almsgiving is the Catholic one. No, put dollar, put bills. The church does not oblige us to give a certain amount of money like other churches, like other religions do. And that is why we're so, uh, we only give to the church what is left over. And the church does not just give us the leftovers. Jesus, the church gives us Jesus Christ. And so how is it possible that I'm going to go to Mass to hear the word of the Lord, to receive his body and his blood, his soul and his divinity and his heart, his mind, etc., all of his person. And I put into the basket a couple of coins that can barely help in putting a light or the air conditioning. They are giving me, the church is giving me life, and not just eternal life, but my life today, because Jesus is the life of the world. And, and there might be a moment, but which is not going to happen, but if there was just one second where there would be not a single mass in the whole world, the world would explode in that moment. Because what sustains the world in existence is the Eucharist. And what sustains us 
in the world that we live, more or less how we are, is the power of Eucharistic adoration. And we cannot stop, and we must stop to think that if we waste what we waste, it could be what someone does not have. Say, Ambrose used to say, the extra sweater that you have in your room is a sweater of your brother who does not have any. We must think that what is a leftover for us and that is a part of the mission that we do when we come here to the Holy Land is to help the Church of the Holy Land. So we ask, please give a good almsgiving because they sustain themselves from the almsgiving of the Mass. Nobody here in the Holy Land helps the Church except from those who come from outside and that is why we have an appointment with the Patriarch of Jerusalem so that we may give him everything that we have gathered so we may help the Christians. Everything that helps the Christians and the Palestinians, those from Palestine, come from the church, and it all comes from external help. And so the Lord here is teaching them to never say, oh, bueno, if the Lord did this miracle, and there's so much that we don't have to worry about taking care of the bread because Jesus can do it once more again. No, Jesus does not want us to ever get used to the gift that we receive. Never. If there were 12 baskets left over, it is because he knew that there was a multitude that would need it, that would need the 12 baskets. If there is any baskets that are left over in your homes, give it to those who have nothing because that consoles the Lord and because that breaks the selfishness of the disciples' hearts because here we see that the disciples which is us think first of ourselves than of the other well if I have bread then maybe I'll have one bread for me and one for the other. No, but first my bread, first my fish, first my shoes, first my dress, first my etc. And then after, if there's anything left, then for the other. No, brothers and sisters, the Lord here, he tells us, no, give me what you have. Oh, Lord, but I only have two pairs of shoes. Well, give me both pairs of shoes. Pay attention to how the apostles who were who did not like to give things out also um, were victorious by their obliged generosity because the disciples left on the boat with 12 baskets of food and after doing this miracle the Lord finally does what he desired to do he goes to pray and to be alone with his father may the Lord teach us here in this place Perhaps not to multiply miracles, the bread and the fish, but to be generous, to give our breads and our fishes with all that perhaps they do not have any bread or any fish. Amen.